great pleasure I get to introduce Mr. Somsekar. He was previously a journalist working with the Times of India. He then joined the firm Udwadia Odeshi and Burgess, which subsequently merged into what is now known as J. Sagar Associates, a big seven law firm. He was a partner at J. Sagar wherein he headed the securities practice. He then left to practice as an independent counsel. One of the many notable cases of which he has been involved in is the ongoing Tata mystery dispute. He has also worked on the policy side of commercial law, being a member of the committees on the takeover code, the insider trading regulation and the financial sector law reform commission, which some of you must have studied. He also writes a weekly column for Business Standard. This is the first course organized by the Center for Corporate and Tax Law, hopefully the first of many to come. The center is a student-run group under the guidance of Professor Sudhanshu Kumar, which aims to promote analytical output in the field of commercial laws. We also seek to increase interest in these laws by organizing such events. We could not have asked for a better person to start off the first event organized by the center. We thank you for coming, sir. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's my first time to Nalsar somehow. It never worked out so far. So, really happy to come here. Thanks for having me. And my apologies for not being able to stick to your original plan schedule and thank you for rejigging things to let me come here. Uh, and Deep was speaking to me about uh, using the time here today. Uh, I was told we'd spend a little bit of time just to get our structure of the evening together. Spend some time giving an overview of securities law and uh, uh, the scope role etc. of this area of law. And I was also told to focus a bit on corporate governance uh, with some particular regard to the Kotak Committee report. But I thought we'll talk about governance with a wider theme. Uh, and I'd like my sessions to be very, very interactive. So feel free to stop me, put your hand up, ask a question. Let's make the most of the time together. And I don't like to do a one-way pontification. It's, it'll be good to address what you really want to discuss. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions. If some of it is uh, too slow, feel free to tell me to st speed up. If it's too fast, don't hesitate to slow me down. Yeah, so can I get a broad sense of the nature of the audience? How many of you are in the fifth year? So how many of you are in the fourth year? Quite a few. Third? Okay, so huge contingent from the third year. Second and first? The rest, okay. So, I was asked to speak about uh, securities uh, regulations. I just uh, want to preface that by saying that uh, the SEBI Act and uh, the regulations made under it are all themed around Two principal objectives of the Act. One is, of course, uh, investor protection, uh, protection of the interests of investors in securities, and the other is uh, orderly development of the securities market. Now, making these uh, twin objectives into uh, one composite regulatory uh, mandate is itself a problematic area. Like one often wonders whether uh, development of a market is at all a regulator's role uh, or should a regulator be an umpire, a referee who regulates uh, how the game is played. Like you don't say that a referee in a football match should bother about how many people attend the match, for example. Uh, the board for control of cricket in India would want stadiums to be full, but the umpire would never want uh, would never need to bother about whether the stadium has more people or less people. The, but one problematic area uh, across uh, legislation in India 
is this bundling of this regulatory mandate and that often leads to a degree of complexity which uh, turns out in more ways than one and we'll talk a little bit about that as we progress uh, through the discussion in the evening. Uh, the other point I wanted to thematically make was uh, investor protection is often perceived as uh, protecting the small investor, uh, protecting the small guys who invest in the securities market. Uh, but equally, uh, predictability of the regulation, predictability of the law uh, is important to protect the large investors, those who set up companies, those who set up businesses, those who issue securities. So predictability is a very, very uh, important aspect of any good regulatory environment. So do you guys follow this ease of doing business rankings and the debate around that when we we rank in the area of law, it's, it's a shame on our profession that in the area of law enforcement, we, we, our country ranks really very low. And uh, it's a responsibility that all of us need to shoulder. Uh, of course, that system also can be gamed. It's ultimately a model, a model picks up on the basis of certain metrics. So we game those metrics, our rank keeps going up a little bit, but the reality on the ground about predictable environment in which businesses can operate to raise money, uh, there's a lot to be done. I mean, SEBI is working on it a lot more in recent months, but I do think uh, it's one grave area of concern. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, but most importantly, the most problematic aspect of this body of law, the SEBI Act, uh, which is again true about other regulators, but most of them have come after SEBI, except for the RBI, which was before SEBI, is the concept of the three pillars of state, the separation of powers of the three pillars of state, all breaks down when it comes to this regulator. The role of the legislator, the lawmaker, the executive, the administrator of the law, and the judiciary, which, you know, interprets and uh, enforces and helps uh, lay down uh, jurisprudence. It's all bundled into one. So you have the doctrine of segregation of powers breaking down in the very design of these regulators. So these are mini states. They have lawmaking power. So subordinate law made possible to the SEBI Act. If you look at section 11 of the SEBI Act, section 11 lists out a whole range of powers of the SEBI Act, but these actually drafted not only as powers, but even as duty. It says it shall be the duty of the board to make regulations uh, to deal with the subjects set out in uh, Section 11. So, when you look at that law-making uh, aspect, that resides in a body corporate called SEBI. Uh, earlier, it needed prior approval of the central government, which is again uh, not of much value, so therefore SEBI was directly given the power to even make law and notify it. Uh, the second part is the executive role, which is basically the administration, the day-to-day -day running of the securities market through stock exchanges, through market infrastructure institutions, through depositories, through uh, brokers and regulating them to enable the market to function is also uh, in the same body, which is SEBI. And then if you look at certain provisions like sections 11.4, 11b, uh, a whole host of uh, decision making in terms of interpretation of the act and the rules, that too sits in SEBI, the quasi judicial rule sits in the same body corporate. Uh, different jurisdictions have tried to deal with this differently. In the UK, you have an upper tribunal, which is called an upper tribunal, but that's actually a trial court. The regulator has to prove its case before an external quasi-judicial body called the upper tribunal. But in SEBI, the first court of trial, the court of first instance is SEBI itself. So it's SEBI that issues a notice, it's SEBI that conducts a hearing, it's SEBI that prosecutes, it's SEBI that judges. So it is a problematic area. Constitutional challenge to this has not yet happened. It will happen someday maybe when circumstances get gross enough to warrant judicial attention to it. But 
This is another thematic uh, fundamental design related point I wanted to table. So in that light, I think uh, all of you should read the SEBI Act. It's a very easy piece of uh, law in terms of structure that's copied across subsequent legislation. If you take the law governing TRAI, if you take the Act governing IRDA or PFRDA or even RERA to, to a large extent, the real estate regulator, it's all modeled on that. So, if you read the SEBI Act, a lot of what I say will also uh, make sense. So, feel free to go back and read it. It's no rocket science, a very easy English. Uh, you all are law students anyway, so it's pretty uh, user friendly uh, legislation. Uh, so, SEBI as a body corporate formed under the SEBI Act also. Uh, it's very light on governance of SEBI itself. If you look at the Act, we're going to talk about corporate governance in the latter part of today's interaction. But uh, if you look at the governance of SEBI as a regulator itself, uh, given that it plays such an important role of a merger of a legislative, executive and judicial role all in one, it's a very light touch regulatory oversight. So the board of SEBI comprises whole time members and the chairman and completely external people who attend SEBI to attend board meetings, right? And there is no regulation of how much work can a board meeting do in one day. There is no provision of how much notice period for a board meeting. I mean, there's so much that you would have read in Companies Act about how a company must be given, the period of a notice, how the board must be structured, what subcommittees the board can have, how many times it must meet, uh, what should be the nature of information availability to be able to take a decision. You'll find a very light touch approach to the governance of the regulator itself. So invariably in practice, the board, which is then a check in balance on the executive or uh, to see how the executive is running SEBI, has got a very light oversight uh, over uh, the executive of SEBI. So, we are going to discuss uh, the literature around a non-executive chairman for a company. We disagree with what you did and therefore we are striking it down. There is a recent example, maybe just before you guys started law school, but it's, it's very rare to see it, but there is one recent example. This was FDI in the retail sector. So, when Walmart came in, uh, not too long ago, 2014, I think, or 2013, maybe early 2014, late 2013, uh, FDI and retail was allowed in subordinate legislation under FEMA. And the members of parliament said, we never thought you would do this. And this is done through subordinate law and we want this to go. So each of these regulations made by SEBI under section 30 is subordinate law needs to be tabled in parliament. Parliament allows a body corporate authorized by it to make law. It also says come back and table it. It's for subordinate legislation committees in parliament to review it. It's another matter that the governance of parliament is broken down and therefore this work doesn't get done efficiently. But when that oversight is broken down and there's no design oversight on how the regulator governs itself, it leads to a very potent design problem of absence of accountability, the only accountability being appellate review over orders and writ petitions challenging regulations made by the regulator. So this is a flavor of the legal conduct, the constitutional construct of how our regulators function and as I said, it's not peculiar to SEBI, this is true of the RBI, this is true of the TRI, this is true of the PFRDA. Another factoid, a little point, there's no performance appraisal of the chairman or the old time director. Like, for example, whether the chairman attends office five days a month or five months a year, whether he, uh, how much time they spend, the old time member, the chairman, the deputy governor of the RBI or the RBI, the performance appraisal and accountability is in there. We discuss a lot about judicial accountability and we talk about people tell us about the breakdown Judges shouldn't be accountable to parliament, etc. Judges should be self-accountable and self-regulated and should be accountable to themselves for a reason. Right? Judges are the ones who are going to 
judge what other sections of the state do and they can't be accountable to other sections of state at all. So they have to be self-regulated. So if you look at the same accountability principle and import it into the regulatory design of SEBI, there is no accountability at the chairman, at the senior management level, chairman, old time members, no performance appraisal, there will be no key performance indicators. So when we talk about corporate governance, we'll talk about regulatory requirements for the board to appraise itself. Right? Board members have to appraise one another and say, are we doing well? Have we performed our role as a board? But that doesn't exist for governance of the regulator's own board. So this is another factor I'd like you, I'd encourage you all to research uh, in the course of your, your tenure as students and examine what can be done. What do other jurisdictions do? Uh, where are we lacking and what can be done? A lot of this you'll also find literature in the FSLRC, the Financial Sector Legislative Reform Committee. Uh, we did a lot of work purely on this aspect because if you set this design right, a lot of the other problems that are attendant to the regulatory space get solved by themselves because the degree of oversight and procedure you bring into how laws can be made, subordinate law can be made or how these organizations may be run. If that's regulated well, the a lot of the problems get addressed because transparency and accountability comes in. But this isn't there. So the part of the SEBI Act which deals with the establishment of the board, role and powers of the board, it's the slimmest part. It's, it's as the usual language. People with experience and understanding of banking, economics, law, you know the generic language you would find about who is eligible to be on the board of SEBI. It's, it's standard language that you will find on who is eligible to be on the board of a public sector bank, who is eligible to be on the board of RBI or any of these other regulators. So that needs bolstering, but that's the state of the SEBI Act as far as that aspect is concerned. Why am I even going into all this? Is this at all relevant from a practice point of view? I think it's very important because this is the science in the soil in which the technology is rooted. So if this soil has a problem, uh, the, whatever sprouts from this soil is attendant with a lot of problems. So you'll never get to the root of what ails some of our regulatory issues if one doesn't have an understanding of this facet of how regulations are made and how the design for regulation making is made. And after Sahara, if you read the Sahara judgment of both the Supreme Court, uh, not only SAT, also the Supreme Court, the scope and powers of SEBI has been extremely expanded. Like Sahara actually tells you that it's not just listed securities, but any issuer of any security which ought to have been listed uh, is also covered by SEBI or anything that is likely to be listed also ought to be covered by SEBI and then this, this discourse overtook itself and in fact the Companies Act got into a provision on insider trading even for unlisted securities. Now you, insider trading is about taking benefit of access that an insider has to a company to the detriment of those who don't have access in the course of trading in the market. Because price discovery takes place in the market. Players in the market are twofold. One who has access to information, one who doesn't. And those who have access taking advantage of those who don't have access is what insider trading is all about. If a security is not even listed, there is no market. You can't have insider trading. It's like swimming without water in the pool. right? You, But Companies Act overtook itself and thanks to the literature and Sahara, in the recent amendment, that got deleted, that got repealed because that section did. It was unworkable section. I mean, you, if you don't have a market, where can you have abuse in the market? So the security is not even listed. Where's the question? So that's again a classic symptom of how this absence of oversight in lawmaking happened. Yeah, the so, since we were talking about the Sahara case and before that you were talking about who can issue securities, whether non-companies can issue them, do you think a lot of these problems stem from the fact that in India we don't really have a jurisprudential foundation of what the security is unlike like your SEC jurisprudence of your Howey and uh, the Howey test. Do you think a lot of that stems from this? Uh, yes and no, but I think if you look at the Securities Contract Regulation Act, 
which does define what is a security. Again, in a very uh, generic manner, uh, this is actually a this is normal. It's 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 symptomatic of any law where law comes in after society is conducted itself in a certain manner. The constitutional framework is also one where anything that's not prohibited is permitted. Right? Many don't know this, many don't even remember this. And ultimately, unless something is prohibited or restricted by validly made law, anything and everything that human conduct pushes you to do is is legitimate under our constitution. It could be selling drugs, it could be consuming drugs, it could be anything. But validly made law can interdict it, can regulate it, can restrict it. Then that law takes takes the field and regulates that area. So securities have existed from the 18th century. Right? Like they've, they've, they've been dealing in stocks, bonds for the longest time. And the SCRA came in 1956, preceded by other regulatory uh, oversight of how markets could organize themselves. And you don't, this is in fact goes to the first point I made of having legislation play a dual role of development and regulation. Right? So you don't really need to create a market by legislation. There can exist a market, people understand what's the security, they trade in it. And then you come in and make law to govern the conduct in that market. So securities market is one such where the market has existed. What is a security is quite conceptually easy to understand. An interest in a property which is transferable and tradable, very loosely put, would be a security which is capable of changing hands, ownership, interest in anything could be a security, which is what the SCRA definition broadly does. And an interest in a security would be a derivative security, etc. So I wouldn't pitch it so high as to say that there's a definitional problem. But even if you define the concept of the lines to draw and where does somebody have a jurisdiction, where one doesn't, needs to be thought through from a policy perspective. We need to define a problem and then write law. We often say, Show me a problem, I'll write you a law, but I'm not going to define what is the problem that I'm solving with this law. And that's in fact the point I was making earlier. And if you look at the FSLRC report and the Indian financial code that got, uh, the draft law that got uh, embedded in the FSLRC report, it actually requires you to, it regulates how to make law, how to make subordinate law. So you have to define what is the problem you're solving, you have to put up the draft law for public debate. You get feedback. You deal with the feedback. You say what you like from the feedback, what you don't like in the feedback, and then make law. Now, the very sound of this, people get cynical. They say, oh my God, you can never make law of this festival in India. Not true. We have this unique feeling of being so peculiar that anything that applies to the world will not apply in India. It's not true at all. You don't need to make an emergency law every day. If you need to make a legal intervention by law making by an emergency, you could. But after that, you got to put it back to the consultative process. If you look at the, I don't remember the name of the judgment, but the call drop case of the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know if it was the Cellular Operators Association or something else. A recent judgment by Justice Nariman. I'm, I'm blanking on the name and the citation. This was a case where the TRAI actually sought public comment on a draft law. All of you experience call drops, right? You all call home, you can't speak to your parents for more than three solid minutes at a time. You're lucky if you do. So they proposed a law to say if there's a call drop, there's an automatic penalty of X rupees per drop on the operator. Now, this was analyzed, there were comments. It was demonstrable that it was not an intelligible penal intervention because the call drop had a variety of other causative factors and a penal solution was not the real solution. The feedback was ignored and the legislation was made. That got challenged in a rate. It went up through the system to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually struck it down 
saying it's arbitrary because you did have this feedback and you didn't deal with it and you went on to uh, make that law. So, and if you look at Australia, if you look at UK, they have legislation which mandates this procedure. And if you follow this procedure and both SEBI and the RBI claim to follow the procedure because they do when it comes to a substantive new law. But a material amendment to existing law, they don't follow the procedure of asking for public comments and it all breaks down. So, be that as it may, we'll come to that uh, as a, as a uh, separate point in a seminar maybe someday on regulatory governance. But the reason I was even going into this space was to give you a flavor of what is it that you would be up against. Uh, whether you're a market intermediary or even a practitioner. So instruments called circulars, instruments called guidelines, instruments called uh, directions, instruments called uh, regulations, and of course also rules made by the government. All of these constitute securities law. Some of them get issued with due process, like section 30, which has to be done, placed before parliament. Rules, similarly, the government adopted a principle that any rule by any department made by the government will follow a pre-consultation process. Right, but this is not always followed. But today there is a legitimate expectation because the law ministry wrote in 2013 to every ministry in the government that there must be prior consultation before any subordinate legislation made by the government. So when rules are made by the government, there is a requirement for prior consultation. Is it always followed? Maybe, maybe not. Is it justiciable if it's not followed? It could be. But not everyone rushes to a writ court. Like as students of law, when we read, we always feel, oh, this is so simple, ultra virus. If it had been challenged, it would have been uh, set aside. It, would, it may have been upheld. It's been existing for so long. If somebody really thought it ultra virus, they would have taken it. No, you don't rush to a red court asking for it because nobody can do that in a vacuum. Courts also don't rule in a vacuum. The person approaching the court needs to be affected by it. There has to be a locus. That person has to have the energy to do social service to clean up the law rather than solve his problem with the regulator or the government and invariably most of the laws that get made, the problems arising from the law that get made is solved by bilateral interaction between the regulator and the regulated and embedded in that is the concept of regulatory capture because a regulator, if you, if you read the history of the last decade in the United States, what went wrong with banking regulation was just that. The, the dialogue between the regulator and the regulated and the patchwork solutions to problem solving leads to such a coagulated uh, commonality of purpose that the regulator and the regulated start thinking alike and that tension breaks down and that's by design meant to be a tension which uh, must not break down. So in our society we've taken it to an art where you say if the regulator allows we can do it. So. Often even the realization that a provision in a regulation cannot be exempted by even the regulator because the regulation governs the regulator too, doesn't really sit very well in our understanding. And invariably we have examples of regulators writing letters saying we will not enforce this part if you don't comply. In very serious provisions they are more cognizant but procedural process driven parts you often see regulators saying we won't do strict enforcement of these provisions and that leads to undocumented jurisprudence and precedents being created and uh, a practice is developing which leads to what is in a different context called crony capitalism at the end of the day someone who has a wherewithal to get that dispensation done would get it someone who doesn't have that wherewithal will not get it so it's another dimension to think about when we think of regulatory governance. So to come back to SEBI, I mean, having said all this, all of this is applied to Section 11. Section 11 deals with powers of SEBI, powers of a civil court, also powers to regulate. It's also as a duty to regulate on specific aspects listed in Section 11. Uh, in that you will find insider trading, price manipulation, substantial acquisition of shares, etc., etc., various uh, regulations made by SEBI can be traced back to clauses in section 11. 11.1 is a very generic 
section says it shall be the duty of the board to regulate. Eleven two says without prejudice to the foregoing, the following items, and you will see all those aspects like price manipulation, insider trading, takeover regulations, delisting, etc., etc. All of them listed there, and that's the basis of uh, regulation making. Section twelve of the SEBI Act actually is a licensing regime under the SEBI Act. Section twelve says no person shall carry on the business of a stock broker, sub broker, mutual fund, etc., etc., etc. Various named intermediaries, unless he obtains registration with the board to provide such service. So that's the section through which regulated activity. The activity becomes regulated activity. So all those activities listed in section 12, 12A, etc., are those activities which require registration with SEBI, and I would call it the licensing section. These are the. This is the provision where uh, SEBI gets the power to make regulations for registration with SEBI. So unless you have a valid registration as a stockbroker, you can't carry out stockbroking activity. Unless you have valid registration as an investment advisor, you can't carry out investment advisory work. Now here, I think the point you made deep become more relevant. What is a stockbroker is not defined. What is the activity of merchant banking not defined. What constitutes a mutual fund not defined, and that can lead to serious problems. So, for example, one of those provisions says no one shall carry out the business of collective investment schemes. Including mutual funds, except by registration with SEBI. Mutual funds, we all understand. There is a SEBI regulation on what is a mutual fund, how a mutual fund can be formed and run, etc. And you have number of mutual funds. Now you had insurance companies doing a product called the unit-linked insurance plan, which in form and substance was a mutual fund, collecting money from investors, investing it. The investor, the contributing investor, having no say in how it is managed, and providing returns. Incidental to it was also insurance cover. The cost of an actuarial uh, risk of risk assessment of what is being insured is built into being absorbed from the returns earned or the investment made into the unit. So this really became a genuine serious question to say: Will this product be a mutual fund and an insurance product? Because the section. On collective investment scheme also says an insurance contract will never be regarded as a mutual fund as a collective investment scheme, but it's a very important reconciliation problem. An insurance contract can never be a mutual fund accepted, but will a mutual fund unit which has an insurance contract attached to it cease to be a mutual fund? It's a question to be asked. Is that product? Actually, an insurance product, just because it's structured as if a mutual fund is structured similarly, will it become a mutual fund? Question to be examined. So the definitional absence happens more in a case like this, where when you go beyond what is a security, you say generically, what's a security is understood. But what is a mutual fund? What is an insurance contract? Where is the two? Where do the two converge? Where don't they converge? This became a serious problem. In fact. SEBI passed an order and said, "All you guys running ULIPs, these are collective investment schemes. You're running this without registration with SEBI. Therefore, come and register." The IRDA was very exercised. In fact, this was 80% of the IRDA's work in the insurance sector. ULIPs constitute. If you look at just the assets under insurance sector, ULIPs was a majority of the insurance assets. The IRDA passed an order. Saying we direct you not to obey the SEBI order. Okay, the question really became: This is an order passed by SEBI. Do you take it to the Securities Appellate Tribunal? In my view, that's the correct place to go. It's an order passed by SEBI. You are aggrieved. No other civil court can have jurisdiction except the writ courts. So can you go to SAT? The answer is yes. People say no. If you go to SAT, you are acknowledging the jurisdiction of the SEBI Act, and therefore. Uh, You would be uh, giving SEBI an upper hand in the litigation. What do you do with the IRDA order to say we direct you not to obey the SEBI order? If you go and register, you would be violating an order passed by IRDA. Now you understand why we have rankings on ease of doing business 
uh, of the way we do. I mean, this is a reality. The two regulators fighting each other, the matter got escalated. The finance minister came out of a meeting, held a press conference and said, I have advised the regulators to approach a court of competent jurisdiction to resolve this question. Right, so one expected regulators to litigate to find out whether a product is a collective investment scheme or an insurance contract or both. Of course, things couldn't get solved that way. It led to an ordinance, the, the, the coordination committee between regulators got embedded into legislation. Earlier, regulators used to meet, the RBI chief, the SEBI chief and the finance secretary and the insurance chiefs used to meet. Obviously, the dialogue in that forum broke down, so that got embedded into the act and it got clarified that a ULIP will never be a mutual fund as a legislative solution which came through an ordinance. And now you have the Financial Stability Council which meets regularly, formally chaired by the Finance Minister and uh, all the regulatory chiefs are members of that council and they uh, resolve their differences in this manner. But the answer really has to be, you got to think about how you regulate, you got to think about what is a mutual fund unit, when will a ULIP also be a mutual fund, when will it not? And regulate that. Are we any wiser today? The answer is no. We only have a solution to say ULIPs will never be like an insurance contract, whether in the form of ULIP or otherwise, will never be a collective investment scheme. But it's a very unhappy uh, situation to be in where two regulators are fighting over turf of what is to be regulated. Because embedded in it is high stakes, embedded in it is this design problem of multiple peak model, like each sector has a regulator. So you say, show me a market, I'll write you a regulator in a law. And uh, each regulator is given powers and turfs get built. Is the solution uh, for the investor, is the object of investor protection met? The answer is no. So this is an example of the definitional problem question that you raised of where it can really go wrong to the uh, full logical end. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Simrat and I'm in the fourth year. Uh, while we're on the question of, uh, you know, definitional issues and the definition of security, I have a question. So what is, uh, is Bitcoin an asset or is it a security? And uh, I do understand that we do tend to make it illegal, but the finance minister in the budget just saying that it's illegal definitely doesn't make it illegal because the RBI guidelines don't reflect any change with respect to that. So if you could expound on it. Okay, that's on its nest by itself. Bitcoin is a is an animal that may need a separate session. Uh, but let me just say this. As a practitioner, when Bitcoins started getting talked about and people would come to me and say, what do you think? We want to get involved. It's very difficult to say, yeah, go ahead. Because in our country, the system is very, very different. Uh, the US Fed had its governor saying that we got to be open to these ideas, we got to encourage it, we got to watch it grow before we come in. Uh, we have a very different approach in this republic. In our republic, the reason I spoke about what is not prohibited is permitted. That concept is a constitutional concept, but not really followed in practice. Right? So, Constitutionally, you say anything that's not prohibited is permitted, but you have acts like FERA, FEMA, which says, unless I approve by general or special order, all transactions in foreign exchange are illegal. Right? So, question really becomes, is such a legislation at all constitutional? But nobody would challenge that lightly. So, in that environment, if you look at somebody promoting an instrument which can literally be currency, in a regulatory environment where, was that thunder or, uh, anyway, in a regulatory environment where uh, who can issue currency is so closely regulated, you're asking for a very, very serious intervention uh, and when that intervention happens, you have no idea which way it will fall. So from a businessman's perspective, it's a very high risk proposition to get interested in Bitcoin with any reasonable expectation of a return. But 
if the question is only a financial business risk, people would be willing to take it. But I think the risk is even higher. Uh, in the environment of currency, you could literally say running a parallel currency is a crime. And if someone's picked up and thrown behind bars, uh, you know, I mean, today if anybody is arrested, uh, getting bail is very, very difficult. I mean, you wouldn't be out for the next at least 30 days, if not 90 days. And I think for something like Bitcoin, it's a, it's a completely different ball game. Has the SEBI thought of Bitcoin as a security and jumped up? Not yet. Will it? Do I expect it to? Of course. If the signal from the state is go after instruments like this, they'll all jump in. Regulators also vie with one another to compete in whatever is the flavor of the month. So, for example, willful defaulter. The RBI has an intervention on who is a willful defaulter to a bank. Securities regulator also jumps in and says willful defaulters must not access the capital market. Now, by design, economically, that may be a very flawed approach because somebody who is a junk bond status with full disclosure and transparency may actually raise risky equity money. But if you say, I won't even let him raise equity money, anybody who's been on the board of a willful defaulter cannot be on the board of any company accessing the markets. You will get nobody to come in to a company's board to revive it because the minute he joins there, every other company sits on is also disqualified. So a lot of this would get solved if there's a pre-legislative consultation. There's a classic example where pre-legislative consultation does not take place. So to go back to Bitcoin, I think you need a separate session for that. But I don't see Bitcoin really working in this country. Also because, I mean, what would you, how would you regulate the trade? I mean, we don't have an exchange for that. Like we have a stock exchange. You can't have an exchange. The problem with Bitcoin, Bitcoin really is this. I mean, it's, the whole thing is underground. And our approach to anything outside an official platform as a state is very, very harsh. So I don't really see but the simplest way to pick up somebody who's made a lot of money in Bitcoin is to pick up his tax return and say, okay, now we're going to come after you. Very difficult. So, again, I mean, it's my view. It's a personal view. I don't think it's a valid business proposition. But are those, again, this again falls into this space of innovation versus regulation. Is Uber a taxi? Is Ola a taxi? Are taxi service risks regulated? Is there a regulatory authority like SEBI for taxis? Yeah. We have the RTO, the issue licenses. So is someone delivering services which are a licensed activity without legislation? The answer is yes. Are we doing anything about it? No. It's, it's extraordinarily... If it's a breakdown in the quality of service rendered, markets solve it. Taxis fall in that category. The regulator is not regulated well enough to enable the consumer to see value in being a consumer of regulated activity, regulated services. So consumers willing to go in for unregulated services like an Uber and an Ola, which is taxi. Right? So... This is where, again, the definitional thing comes up. If stockbroking and taxi services are similar, stockbrokers, your taxi driver, you want to buy a security, you go to him, you pay him his broker, and say, I want to buy this share, he should be able to do it for you with an account opening form, starting an account with him. If you have a service which is akin to that, and you're not registered with SEBI, is it an offense? It is. So again, it becomes a question of how aggressive or how timid a regulator feels about its turf being violated. Uh, in the financial sector, the innovation versus regulation line is not that blurred because even courts feel that when it comes to your savings, when it comes to your money, we are going to throw the rule book at you a lot more harshly. Whereas a writ petition against Uber, a judge knows that when his daughter wants a taxi to go from college to home, she may, the guy may not, he may refuse to apply, but on her app, she gets an Uber and she gets a clean vehicle, she gets to go. So the awareness of 
the breakdown in that service is more widely known, whereas the need for a regulated service in the financial sector is more heavily perceived and perhaps rightly so. Because at the end of the day, many people play around with, when, it, when you make money, it's very attractive to make money, even through unregulated work. When you lose money, you come back in. And let's talk about a real example. Take the NSEL scam. That is again a huge interplay between commodities and securities. That was an exchange, but not an exchange. It was called a spot exchange. If you go strictly by the letter of the law, it was not a stock exchange. It was not a commodity derivative exchange. People traded on it, structured contracts in a manner where they earn 24% returns, 48% returns, unheard of returns. But when the party stopped, they all said, oh, the, it's a scam. How did this happen? Go after the company, go after the promoter of the company, go after the promoter of the promoter. So when things break down, scale attracts adverse attention in this republic. So long as it's de minimis, things go on. The whole thing about innovative disruption is that when you talk about Uber or Ola, it's innovative disruption. It, it, the scale is small. It's not widely known. Those who use autos are not using these. Suddenly it gains a scale and a mass where it's too big to fail. And then you say, okay, now the choice of a state is, do I now write regulation to regulate it or do I come in and ban it? And a better approach is to say, let me come in and write regulation to regulate it, which is what worldwide people have done with Uber. If you go to Singapore, if you look at New York, if you look at Boston, or London, people are talking about draft law to regulate aggregators like Uber Ola. Recognize that it's a service. You'd rather deal with that service as a social reality and regulate it than pretend it doesn't exist and say those who drive an Uber car will be sent to jail because they're running a taxi service without getting a license. So, again, that's a choice. In that choice, in the financial sector, in our country, the impression that too many people have gotten away with too much for too long is very high and therefore coming in to regulate something that's already gained steam is seen as endorsing the corrupt, endorsing the violator and therefore Bitcoin in my view, in this country at least, will be a far, far cry. Remember we are a country where exchange controls are robust even today. So if we didn't have exchange controls and Money didn't have borders, money didn't have a passport control or a residence-based control at the border. The Bitcoin tsunami would take over India. But as it develops, we have so many barriers, we have so many restrictions. I think it's a, it's a very different uh, phenomenon as far as India is concerned. So to come back to the SEBI Act, Section 11, Section 12, uh, 12 lets you regulate number of regulations stock broker regulation, mutual fund regulation, merchant banking regulation, underwriter regulations, etc., etc., have been made using the various activities referred to in Section 12. Not all of them are well defined in terms of what is the activity that makes you an underwriter, what is the activity that makes you a stock broker, what is the activity that makes you a merchant banker. It's all mixed up. The next aspect I want to talk about is the moving away from the regulatory legislative space to the executive space, the power to issue directions. Section 11B is a very generic section. It simply says, SEBI may issue such directions as it deems fit in the interest of the securities market, in the interest of investors in the securities market. There is a bit of an article 142 in the SEBI Act. In the interest of is like to render complete justice, the Supreme Court may pass such orders as it deems fit. 11B is one such. It was always there in the Banking Regulation Act, but not used because a bank is a very different animal again. You can't, if you tell a bank you violated, and we'll talk about banks in our second segment today because when we discuss governance, what you read in the newspapers every day in the last several weeks is all about governance and banking. So. I'm going to thematically talk about that. But we'll park that when we discuss governance. So as far as uh, the SEBI Act 11B is concerned, it started getting used 
why a chairman who came with a reserve bank background, a former deputy governor, he said, I'm going to test this power. And he started using that power to direct people not to sit on the board of a stock exchange, direct someone not to deal in securities until further notice, direct someone not to act as a stock broker for the next six months, not to launch any mutual fund scheme, not to come up with an IPO. These were directions which were considered to be remedial in nature but has an impact that is punitive in character but all under 11b. In a very gross case, this got challenged. Read the judgment in Anand Rati versus Sevi where it was found that office bearers of a stock exchange were picking up the phone and asking the officials running the stock exchange about which broker had how much position, who had how much risk, etc. Et when this came to light, the regulator directed those office bearers not to associate themselves with any stock exchange, directed them not to report to work in a stock exchange and issued directions seeking, invoking powers under section 11b. This got challenged in a writ. The Bombay High Court thumpingly ruled that the witnessbury principle of reasonableness is the only touchstone for looking at a direction under 11b. Aside of that, it's a wide carte blanche, it's a wide blank check available to the regulator to come in, interdict, a regulator was said to be, not to be left in a helpless position of twiddling its thumbs. If it needs to intervene, it can intervene and use section 11b and issue directions. The debate then became, once it finds something, it can come in. Therefore, if there is investigation, there's prima facie findings, there's something on the table for the regulator to intervene and remedy it could use 11b. The regulator also started using it in an ex parte manner. But no, no one would have a clue that something is brewing in the regulator to wake up one morning and pass an ex parte order and say, Mr. XYZ is directed not to deal in securities, pending investigations by us. Now this again went up in appeal, got looked at. The Securities Appellate Tribunal in Goruka Finance versus SEBI simply said that so long as an investigation is underway, SEBI can indeed issue an order because it would have done its investigation and would have formed. So even before that, SEBI realized the problem about the remedy versus a punitive debate that would come up in every case. So it got Parliament to amend Section 11 to introduce 11.4 which said before, during or after an, a final order is passed, SEBI may issue direction. So the fact that you don't need to conduct proceedings and culminate in a direction got legislated in section 11 bracket 4. So once that came in, case law then developed into when can this power be used? Even before an investigation is ordered, can it be used? And then the answer from the tribunal was, so long as there is an order directing investigation, an investigation would have commenced or was found necessary to commence, that order internally got passed only because we found prima facie need to investigate and therefore 11.4, the jurisdiction of 11.4 would start. So this directions under sections 11, 11b, so if you read any order of SEBI, Recently under these sections, it would quote both. It would just say, this is a direction under section 11 and 11b of the SEBI Act. So what color it takes, what picture it takes, doesn't matter, it gets issued. This also takes, yeah. Use my From what I've understood from articles and CD commentary on the SEBI Act is uh, 11b and section 11.4, so 11 subsection 4 are called sister provisions. So practically, uh, so I have a doubt, so practically today does there exist a difference in the scope and purpose of 11B and 11.4 or are they basically provisions which will be used together in passing an order? Yeah, so I think it's important, I think even the regulator doesn't have a real answer which is why it throws in both these sections. But let's just see why did 11.4 come in. 11B was held to be incapable of being put to use to inflict a penal consequence by the Securities Appellate Tribunal. If you see the judgments in the case of Sterlite, PPL and Videocon of the Securities Appellate Tribunal, orders of SEBI were actually set aside 
saying these are punitive orders you conducted a probe you done an investigation you conducted a hearing and then you're saying you're doing a remedial direction can't be it's then a, actually it's a proper quasi judicial order 11b doesn't give you the power now 114 because it uses the terminology before or after completion of investigation it cloth sebi with the power to put it to use even before investigation is over and also put it to use after investigation is over so to that extent 11b can be superfluous 114 having come in but both are pressed into service whether they are remedial or not is no longer a debate because of the nature of 114 because it literally says sebi can as a parliamentary endorsement which overtook the rulings in bpl stellar video con in the tribunal and in fact uh, if you look at the notes on clauses and the literature that preceded the introduction of 114 they actually said this is why they are bringing in 114 so whether you call it sister brother etc doesn't really matter the regulators clothes with like multiple arrows in the quiver they fire it all in one go There's a mic on your table. B was uh, like you said that it that that it it could not have penal consequences. So you're saying that limitation does not exist for eleven four. It or doesn't exist for eleven four. Eleven four also eleven order can not be remedial. Also, it can be penal. That's what. That's the way courts have upheld it. It went on so much so in a in a judgment called Ajay Agarwal versus C B, the Supreme Court. virtually calls 114 11 bs procedural provisions and given it retrospective effect like an interdiction uh, an order under this section passed in relation to a case when this section was not on the statute book 11b as you know the capital b means it came later 114 came later for a pre 1995 situation it was pressed into service there is a ruling by the supreme court saying these are process provisions and therefore they can be used the power is there generic 11 gives in the eyes of the supreme court in that judgment 111 gives you powers wide enough and 114 11 b etc merely adjectival to the because they are without prejudice to the generality of 111 so these are gray these are tricky areas i mean these are as you know supreme court is always right because it's final it's not final because always right all all disputes have to end somewhere at ends at the supreme court and case law emerges if you read sar i even talks of investor protection being a fundamental right i mean the whole line between what's a fundamental right a constitutional right a legal right all that is getting blurred in the way judgments are being rendered but the bottom line is these are today too fine a nuance for it to have any practical relevance even in the eyes of a court because i'll tell you a real example the prevention of money laundering act are you guys conversant with the pmla so the pmla is a legislation which essentially requires various segments of society like trustees i would say or gatekeepers i would say providing services in various segments of society to report if something suspicious takes place in fact in the original design even lawyers were supposed to were envisaged as intermediaries who would have had to report suspicious conduct to the intelligence unit under the pmla that was not brought into law it was never given effect to today it resides only in the market financial markets banks all intermediaries under section 12 of the sebi act all insurance companies etc etc are required to report Now the Act also recognizes that you can't have one more authority trying to learn banking, trying to learn stock broking as to what is suspicious. So the Act says officials of SEBI, RBI, etc. will play an assistant role, will play a role of assistance to the authorities under PMLA, and in aid of that, the circulars for the suspicious reporting are to be drafted and published and notified by these regulators. So when SEBI issues a circular playing its role under the PMLA, in the last para it adds a line. The circular, the subject says, circular under section so and so of the PMLA, 
The last paragraph says this circle was also issued under Section 1111B of the CBI. I, I myself argued a case where we said this is a breakdown because this is a two constitutional, two two legislations with two completely different objectives are in play. Your role under PMLA was to write the circular. You can't by writing a line saying it's also under 11B. Now punish a violation of the circular under the SEBI Act because SEBI imposed a penalty for violation of a circular under PMLA under the SEBI Act. That is the PMLA has its own provisions for violation of that circular. So you had two legislations being pressed into service for violation of one circular. Why? Because that circular is authored by an authority which drew its power or chose to quote also an additional power under another act. We lost in the tribunal. It was a trial balloon from SEBI. They imposed a very minor penalty and the tribunal upheld the order. That client, because too minor, didn't carry it as a constitutional question to the Supreme Court. But the question is at large. So, if you look at it from that angle, today the source of power has ceased to matter. If you read even Sahara, the whole interpretation of Section 55A of the SEBI Act, of the Companies Act, of looking at what falls within the MCA, what falls within SEBI, our people will, uh, they will fall under both. That distinction which was sought to be made between ULIP and Collective Investment Scheme today has broken down when it comes to the securities market. And again, scale and a perception of fraud drives judicial decision making on these questions. So when it came to Sahara, the question was, oh my God, 55,000 crores, 75,000 crores, whatever number it was, so many people are involved. Actually, Sahara was actually a PMLA case. There were no debenture holders who were aggrieved. But there were fake debentures, fake debenture holders. That is a fit case to say, move under PMLA, you had a valid legislation to attach those properties. Inexplicably, that is not done. Somehow it continues to be a securities violation. It continues to be monitored under 142 in the larger scheme by the Supreme Court, but triggered initially under the SEBI Act and it continues to be in the books of law. It continues to be seen as a securities violation that is under uh, determination that has been determined and under uh, continued administration by the Supreme Court. Again, strictly legally erroneous in my view because it was evidently a PMLA situation which should have been pressed into service. All that is being done can be done legitimately under PMLA. You can actually send a man behind bars under PMLA. Would you sending a man behind bars initially in the name of contempt but then not contempt then it's an extraordinary jurisdiction. There are orders saying this is not a precedent for all cases, but this man will be behind bars, out under parole. And the whole principle of when the law says something must be done in a certain way, it must be done in that manner alone, is now history as far as this interplay in the environment is concerned, which is my which is the driver of my answer to your Bitcoin question as well. Because it's all very fuzzy out there. If the concept is do good and attack evil, there's enough provisions there to say, okay, I'm doing this to attack evil. And then the rule of law is all about who's done right, who's done wrong. And that's the problem actually. The problem has been embedded in, it's rooted in 11B and how 11B got used in a very, very amorphous plastic manner, such directions as you deem fit in the interests of society, in the interests of the market. One additional question on that. So, with respect to Section 11B, uh, while I understand that I talked about that with respect to as compared to taxi. Okay. But would you say that Section 11B has been overextended too much, or do you think? Uh, uh, the interpretation of Section 11B has been consistent with its purpose. You know, in my view, I think Section 11B has uh, been overdone, has been overused. A time will come when a court will be called upon 
to interpret it. If you read a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, the Human Rights Court, Strasbourg, struck down an identical provision, uh, an identical order using such a power in Italy. The Italian Securities Regulator said that a certain solicitor cannot sit on the board of any securities company because of how he conducted himself in a certain case. And it went up all the way as a human rights violation. And the ECHR actually ruled that it's violative of the European principles on human rights. In a given case, it can happen. I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. There's been a stockbroker against whom an ex party order was passed saying you violated the act. We are investigating, pending investigation, don't deal in securities. That ex parte prohibition of his continued for literally four years. In the meantime, the investigation was over. In the meantime, inquiry proceedings were conducted. And the recommendation of a penalty under inquiry was a three month suspension. That report was hidden, it was not even given to him. And they said, we continue to investigate and 11B continued. Courts didn't intervene at all until that report surfaced saying a quasi judicial procedure that took place in the organization actually came up with a three month recommendation. The man has been out of the market for so long. It translated into okay, he'll start next week. But no one came down saying, is this acceptable? Is this an acceptable breakdown in the rule of law? In a given case, it may happen. Maybe not in the next half a decade or a decade because uh, being in a business suit is not a great place to be in uh, in these times across the globe. You see, the prima facie view of a market intermediary or a businessman is you must have done something wrong if the regulators are after you. And therefore, also the protection of action taken in good faith by a regulator is a very serious protection. Uh, the tribunal had started imposing costs. Okay, the Securities Appellate Tribunal had started imposing costs on SEBI for picking up wrong cases and abuse of living. In one of my cases, if you read Matthew Esau versus SEBI, where Se uh, SEBI took a position that his traits and his comments on those stocks were contrary to each other. And therefore, he pervaded what he himself did not believe to be true. And therefore, securities fraud. 11B order. It came first under 11D, which was a cease and desist order and then went into adjudication. Not exactly 11B, but 11D under a cease and desist order. Eventually, when we proved that his recommendation was completely misread and a whole case of fraud was based on that, the tribunal imposed a cost of a lakh on SEBI. Now, the Supreme Court said, oh, it's not right to impose costs on regulators and the, the, the person died actually, the case didn't really, the appeal, SEBI's appeal didn't get fully heard. The action he passed away and we didn't have jurisprudence developed on that. But tribunal had started imposing costs, but again it's a question of judicial attitude and that too varies person to person. Okay, then uh, comes the enforcement, 11B being remedial. The other two important points I want to make before we conclude with the SEBI Act is under each of these subordinate regulations, you can also act for breach of what is called a code of conduct or individual requirements under those regulations. So if a stockbroker regulation stipulates a minimum net worth, uh, violation of that, or uh, it has some operational requirements, violation of those, those lead to inquiry proceedings under the intermediaries regulations, which has varying penalties like suspension, of registration for a certain period to cancellation of registration which is like a death sentence on the registration. So that's one track which applies to market intermediaries. Another track which applies to market intermediaries and others is chapter 6a of the SEBI Act which provides for monetary penalties, imposition of monetary penalties for violations specified in that chapter. 15A, 15B, the whole series right up to 15I, 15J. Now, those are adjudication proceedings which are administered by an adjudicating officer under 15I 
and he has to take into consideration factors set out in 15J. The factors in 15J are things like gain made by the violation, loss suffered by others because of your violation, repetitive nature of your violation. These are the three inclusive factors listed. Now again, the Supreme Court in one of these cases held these to be exhaustive factors and also held the badly drafted provisions to be mandatory penal provisions, literally saying that there is no discretion at all left, that whatever is the penalty stipulated there must be imposed. So for example, the failure to file a disclosure document when due is punishable with 1 lakh per day. Now 1 lakh per day is to be imposed regardless of whether you came under the bus or whether you forgot or whether you deliberately didn't file. It's unconstitutional. So another bench of the Supreme Court said such a reading of that section is wrong. But being another bench, it has been referred to a larger bench. So if you read chapter 6a, chapter 6a uses the word shall be punishable with a penalty, shall be liable to a penalty and sets out the pain penalty amounts. So this question will be determined by a larger bench of the Supreme Court as to whether this is a fixed mandatory penalty or it can vary on the basis of uh, the facts of the case. And frankly, how can varying facts not lead to varying penalty? How can a wanton violation be the same as a uh, inadvertent technical default? But it's gone to a larger bench, hopefully. The larger bench will state the obvious and uh, clean up the error in the uh, earlier order. If you read uh, if you read these judges, maybe what I'll do is I'll compile a set of uh, source material and send it to you guys uh, sometime next week. So each of these uh, you could you could refer to. There is a fourth arrow in the quiver. So you have 11B, you have monetary penalty, you have disciplinary proceedings for suspension cancellation. There's a fourth one which is criminal prosecution. Section 24 of the SEBI Act essentially criminalizes every violation of every provision of the Act, rules and regulations made thereunder. And this is again a problematic drafting. It essentially says that any and every contravention of the Act is also a criminal offense. And frankly, what can be compounded once a criminal proceeding starts? Only such offenses which are not punishable with imprisonment. That is a copy from the Companies Act which has varying provisions on some imprisonment for some and fine for some. The section 24 says you are punishable with imprisonment or fine or both for all. So it's a very problematic uh, drafting of a provision. Uh, Parliament needs to clean this up. It's been 25 years but these things don't get cleaned up. In fact, it got replicated in the SCRA and the Depositories Act. The same error was uh, drafted into those uh, legislation which didn't have criminal prosecution provision and the same problem continues there as well. So, if you look at these four tracks, uh, one principle that would come out is when it comes to criminal prosecution, that alone requires the regulator to go outside and convince a third party judge with a criminal standard of proof which is beyond reasonable doubt. All the others, monetary penalty, adjudication proceedings or section 11b proceedings are civil standard which is a preponderance of probability where what would a reasonable man say likely happen is the test to be applied rather than can you put beyond reasonable doubt a conclusion that this indeed happened. Right? So the standard of proof is lower. Uh, having said that, when it comes to a heinous, there's also a hierarchy and a caste system in the violations. Because to settle these civil proceedings, SEBI came up with a settlement regulation where you heard of plea bargains in the United States, you heard of settlement of proceedings. So under this body of law, under this body of regulations, you can settle the civil aspect of the proceedings, the 11 day proceedings, the adjudication proceedings, etc. Not section 24, but all these. In that, again, this again goes to the quality of lawmaking and the pre-consultation and the degree of oversight and all of that gets underlined. 
There's a regulation which says SEBI will never settle the following violations. Insider trading, price manipulation, violations having market-wide impact, etc., etc. And then a proviso saying, notwithstanding the foregoing, SEBI may settle any of the foregoing if it so chooses. Now, these are all completely arbitrary lawmaking. I mean, how do you say the following will never be settled? And then say, not to stand the foregoing, we may indeed settle. Might as well say, we'll settle when we like it, we will not settle when we don't like it. Which would then be arbitrary and therefore unconstitutional, violative of Article 14. So these are aspects that one has to think through when you read the SEBI Act and the provisions under it. So given the hierarchy, like when you say that insider trading will never ordinarily be settled, the standard of proof may be civil but it would still be of a higher standard as compared to the standard of proof brought out in a case involving forgetting to file a document. So when someone is accused of a more heinous offence, even in a civil standard, the degree to which you would test the preponderance would be of a higher degree as compared to how you test a lower violation. Now what is higher, what is lower? case law will develop, I mean the whole hierarchy will develop, but it's easier, if you if you read one of my favorite examples in this is the Harbhajan Singh case, where he was accused of a slur, of a racial slur in Australia, and that was decided by a New Zealand judge that has great uh, analysis of this, when, when it's drugs or drug abuse or uh, racial slur in cricket, the standard of proof, even in that civil proceeding, should be higher Whereas if it's a violation about whether you send someone a farewell or, you know, you question an umpire's decision, it would still be a civil standard but of a slightly even lower standard because you don't, you can rush to say he was wrong. Whereas if it's a racial slur, you have to test it on a slightly higher footing to say, did he say what he was accused of saying or did he use a, uh, did he call him a monkey or did he ask, give him a Maharashtrian abuse was the question in that case. So, a similar hierarchy would come into play even when you look at a security violation. Is it a, is it a market fraud or is it a technical breach? Because one point to bear in mind, because another Supreme Court judgment in Sriram Mutual Fund versus SEBI literally says that when it comes to these monetary penalties, intention and mens rea is irrelevant. So, if a violation takes place, penalty must follow. So if that is so, then of course the varying of the penalty on the basis of other facts becomes very important. So if you look at the Sriram Mutual Fund case, the ratio, and it's not been uh, revised in any subsequent ruling, it literally says as far as Chapter 6 is concerned, if the violation is proven, penalty must follow. And that's a case that went ex parte actually. The person who filed filed, but he was not available, so it was argued ex parte and ruled on ex parte to lay down the law. So this is the law. And if you see most of the SEBI orders, it would quote Shreda Mutual Fund like a mantra to say now that we've shown there's a violation, penalty must necessarily follow. So each of these, the, the on the civil side, SEBI is the judge and the prosecutor. And therefore, the next future jurisprudence will be on whether in this state of affairs, do you need a segregation of the judicial function and the executive function within SEBI? Can a person who is running the executive role oversee the quasi-judicial role? Like who does a performance appraisal? Or can a junior officer who is playing a quasi-judicial role rule that someone is not guilty without fear or favor if his performance is appraised by the boss who oversees the executive role? So these are questions that are at large. I leave you to ponder over these. Uh, this is an overview of the act and the, the terrain in the securities uh, regulatory environment. Should we take a break here and then reconvene? If there are any questions before that break, happy to take them or we can continue the dialogue after the break. So we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back for the second set. Uh, before that, uh, we'll just be taking attendance for everyone here. 
I didn't realize I was doing something that involves attendance. I didn't realize I was doing something. Any being important. Segregation of role between chairman and managing director. To have a non-executive chairman and an executive, uh, chief executive who is a managing director. None of that works uh, in the design of the regulatory organization itself. So it has an executive chairman and a few non-executive uh, directors, uh, many of whom are nominees of other arms of the state. There's a nominee from the Reserve Bank, there's someone from the Law Ministry, there's uh, uh, someone from the MCA. So it's a loosely, loosely formed oversight body, which is the board. So when you say Securities and Exchange Board of India, this is the board. So the board is largely driven by the executive rather than the uh, non-executive. So the executive, non-executive tension that is designed into corporate governance or is designed into governance of the state or the polity, and when you look at it from a political science point of view of the executive being answerable to parliament, uh, that degree of oversight is not designed, it's not embedded in the design of how SEBI is governed and this is true for every other regulator. It's true for TRAI, it's true for PFRDA, IRDA, etc, etc. So that's another thought I thought I'll, if I have to seed some thoughts and provoke some line of thinking for an organization like yours, for a group like yours, this is something that I encourage you to research and think about. Uh, having given this base uh, outline, I mean, again, to go back from a constitutional approach, you know about the union list, the state list, and the concurrent list. We in India have securities typically clearly in the domain of the union, unlike the United States, which has a company law as a state subject, we have company law as a uh, union subject. So, uh, securities law does not work in a vacuum, it, it sits a stride companies act because largely the issuers of securities are, are companies. Uh, can non-companies issue securities? Sure, mutual funds do, AIS do and we'll talk about those and the governance framework for those we'll talk about. But could others issue securities? Surely they could. Uh, have we recognized that they could? Very grudgingly. And we'll talk about it when we discuss collective investment schemes which is what EIFs and mutual funds are. So, by and large, it's a corollary, it's, it's, it sits by the side of Companies Act. The question of cognate legislation uh, came up in Sahara, for example, if you read the Sahara decision of the SAT, the Securities Appellate Tribunal, it discussed this issue, for example, in a definition section when you say words and expressions not defined here would carry meaning from some other legislation. So those legislation become relevant, recognized by parliament. Parliament says, hey, I've already made these laws. So if there's any doubt about any concept that's not clear from here, go look there. So by design, those are legislations that are connected to the legislation in question. So Companies Act is clearly uh, a cognate uh, legislation for uh, the SEBI Act. Having said that, there are aspects of the Companies Act which governs the securities market, which got delegated to SEBI uh, because earlier it used to be the central government and the central government said why should there be a dual role because that too led to a regulatory arbitrage. So, so long as it related to listed companies, those powers got delegated to SEBI. Equally, those powers did reside for a long period of time in the central government as well. So you had situations where SEBI would seek to enforce something under the Companies Act, but the same offense could get compounded by the stream under the central government. And you also find this conflict between the Enforcement Directorate and the RBI. For example, violations of FEMA can be compounded by the RBI as well as by the Enforcement Directorate. So again, we we replicate these problems, we duplicate these problems, we don't learn from them and solve them in subsequent legislation, but thematically you will find this interplay across sectors and that's true of the securities regulatory framework as well. So to go back to the design of the SEBI Act, so you have this body corporate called SEBI, 
form with a budget of its own, it makes a lot of money from regulating the market. Uh, please read the Supreme Court decision called BSC Brokers Forum versus SEBI. The question in issue there was, is SEBI's imposition of a turnover-based registration fee on stockbrokers a tax or is it a fee? If it's a fee, is it reasonable? Is it got any commensurate intelligible linkage to the work that SEBI does for registering brokers? Uh, it got challenged, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, got thoroughly upheld by the Supreme Court. Good law doesn't always make good economics. You have good law leading to bad economics. Uh, bad law sometimes being good economics is a classic example of that. An ad valorum registration fee on stockbrokers literally underwrote this organization for a large part of the early 90s. SEBI was formed uh, in 1988 through a government resolution. It was not a statutory body. And in its initial days, it basically was like a research body looking at the capital market. So it collated data, published data, how much capital got raised, how many companies came to the market. In those days, approval for approaching the market came from a body called the controller of capital issues. Uh, that got replaced when we had our economic crisis in 91. One of the World Bank conditionalities was to have an independent regulator removed from government rather than a CCI. Those days, CCI was not competition commission. It was controller of capital issues. And CCI would approve the price at which you could raise capital. And that was really impeding capital formation in the country. We moved from uh, controlling the price at which securities could get issued to a regime where you make disclosures about risks, disclosure about prospects, and choose to let the market choose to price the issuance of your security. But what is control? What is regulation? It's a question at large. So in my view, we today have control in the name of regulation in a lot of aspects of the securities market. In a lot of other aspects, you have control going away and regulation coming in. So again, I encourage you to think back about the role of a referee. A referee in a football match is a regulator. He doesn't tell you how many players to field. Those are rules that are already there. How many players per side? What is the scale of the field? What are the dimensions? What's an offside? What's allowed? What's not allowed? The rules are already there. The referee is letting the game run. He's a regulator. But when you get to decide... Uh, what should be the size of the field, when you get to decide how much fees you can charge, when you get to decide uh, what quality issues can come to the market, you're going back to control, it's no longer regulation. And this is again an area no court has been called upon to explicitly say that this piece of in this instrument represents not regulation but control. Uh, people use these phrases in very loose terms, so in a lot of facets, you will find that uh, uh, if you research more intensely, uh, you would find questions that would emerge in other areas of law that you study uh, that you could apply to this sphere as well. So take an example, if you look at tariff regulation in the electricity sector or the telecom sector, you'll have a telecom regulator which approves, uh, you know, which used to deal with how you could uh, do tariff for usage of telecom services. Or electricity, where you look at the fuel use, the cost use, you do a cost plus model, you do a variety of models, it's a very different way to regulate. But those are explicit legislation that enable tariff fixation and embed tariff authority for major posts or the telecom regulatory authority. These are legislation where the regulator is given explicit powers to fix tariff for usage. The SEBI Act does not do that and because the, the concept of SEBI was to move away from control and to enable a free play of market forces to price securities, to price services in the securities market. But does SEBI impose caps on what a mutual fund can charge? Yes. Does SEBI say movement of securities from one depository to another should be free of cost? Yes. Is that tariff regulation? Potentially, yes. Is that ultra is the act? Potentially, yes. I mean, questions can get decided only if someone thinks it fit 
or is aggrieved enough to take it to a constitutional court and challenge it in a writ. Not every dispute gets taken to a constitutional court. So in that line, there's another line of uh, judgments which I just wanted to touch upon. Particularly when we look about this inter interplay between the legislative and the quasi-judicial role, SEBI issued a circular saying movement of securities from one depository to another should be free of charge, should not be priced at all. This got challenged in the appellate tribunal as an order and we'll talk about the whole appellate review piece and it makes sense when we discuss that. Uh, the question was what is an order, can a circular at all be an order? And the tribunal said any instrument that is binding, the breach of which would lead to consequences, civil consequences, would be an order. Because if you look at section 15T of the SEBI Act, it says any person aggrieved by an order made by SEBI may appeal in the Securities Appellate Tribunal. As I said a little while ago, the UK has an upper tribunal, which is not an appellate tribunal. It's a trial court. The conduct authority or the prudential regulatory authority has to take a case to the upper tribunal, prosecute the case, convince the judge sitting in that tribunal that it has a case, and then get an order passed. SEBI passes the order, sitting in its own office, conducts a trial in SEBI. SEBI is a trial court. So, in that light, also seen in the context of an ouster of jurisdiction of civil courts, look at section 15Y and 20 capital A, 15 capital Y, 20 capital A, all jurisdiction of all civil courts stands ousted when it comes to areas where SEBI and the tribunal has jurisdiction. So it is a unique tribunal which is a tribunal wholly uh, mandated to look at appeals from any order passed by SEBI. So if you use an instrument, you call it a circular or you call it a letter or you call it a guideline or you call it not a regulation because the regulation section 30 explicitly has a reference to how to carry out the objects of the act and enable SEBI to make regulations. A regulation made by SEBI has to be tabled in both houses of parliament for 30 days. Then it becomes so you know subordinate laws made across all legislation, right? Do you know of a single instance, recent instance where parliament actually looked at subordinate law saying, okay, we delegated it to you, you made law, 